17, this, these things I command you that you love one another. I wanted to uh, jump off from this particular text to talk about, you know, the greatest love that we uh, have expressed towards us, a love that uh, helps us define and understand love and other verses in the Bible that deal with love and uh, appreciate the love that God has given toward us and be able to appreciate that love by reciprocating that love, not just to one another, as we have been told here, but to, to, towards God who first loved us. Uh, there are many verses in the Bible we might refer to as profound verses that deal with God's love. And First uh, John, John is one of those individuals who talks about God's love a lot. Uh, the Gospel of John, 1 John 4, God is love. Um, if we know God is love, then we know what, God, what love is because we can just see the characteristics of God, God and how he expressed that. And, of course, uh, in John chapter 3, uh, perhaps the most famous verse of love, John 3, verse 16, and a verse that we quote a lot, rightfully so, uh, a verse that has been memorized by many, rightfully so. Uh, but uh, sometimes um, either we know it too well that we don't know it as well as we ought, <laughs> or individuals quote it but don't think about what it says. So you kind of have two extremes there where it has sometimes things become so common or comfortable to us we really don't know what it says. So we know it, but we don't. Uh, so it's worthy of our time to, to look at God's love through, through the eyes of John 3.16 and jumping off here in John 15 where the Bible tells us there's no greater love than this, that a man give his life for his friend. Now, Jesus calls us friends, those individuals who uh, hear his word, believe his word, and obey him. Uh, but uh, we'll talk about at the end of John 3.16 how we become a friend to God, how we become a friend to Jesus. But that love that Jesus showed, Jesus didn't just die for his friends. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, uh, the Bible tells us that he died for the ungodly. He died for those who hated him. He was the propitiation not just for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. And so uh, the love that Jesus showed to mankind is a love that's greater than the love that we could express, right? Uh, the love that Jesus showed was to those who loved him, those who didn't know about him, those who hated him, and those who deny him. Uh, that's a greater love than the love that we read about in John 15, verse 13. And when we go to John 3, verse 16, uh, we know, the, we know what the verse says, but it does us well to kind of look to it in detail. The, the love of God is great, number one, because of the source of the love. As I mentioned in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. We wouldn't know what love is without God. People today still don't know what, God, what love is because they don't look to see what God determines or defines as love. Uh, I, it's a bit disgusting to see uh, rainbow flags and things like that that say love is love. No, there's different kinds of love. Uh, there are, uh, some are uh, ordained by God and some are antithetical to God. Uh, the love sometimes that is, sometimes the love that is referred to is lust. And lust is a sin of the flesh. It's not something to be uh, celebrated is not something people should be proud of. Uh, those are things that God doesn't appreciate. Doesn't, that's not how God defines love. So we, if we're going to know what love is, we have to look to the source of love and allow God to define love. Man's been doing this for a long time, calling evil good and good evil. The prophet Isaiah tells us about that. And he says, woe to them who call evil good and good evil. Uh, but that's what, you know, we have a lot of people in the world that equivocate, they try to make one thing equal another. 
we have to be intelligent enough to know, right? That's why we have to study to show ourselves approved. We have to know the truth, be able to defend the truth, and we have to be able to know when somebody's lying to us or trying to deceive us. Uh, because love always isn't love as it's defined in our world today. So those people might agree with John 3.16, though. But they equivocate the love of God with a, a distasteful lust. So the source of God, the source of love that is the greatest love is because it comes from God. God is the creator, therefore he gets to define what love is. God is love, so whatever God is, is love. And God isn't a lot of things that people call love today. As I mentioned, a lot of things people call love today is antithetical to God. That's not the love we read about in the New Testament. God is uh, immutable. He's never wrong, <laughs> right? Uh, he's all-knowing. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's holy. Uh, Charles did a sermon last week about being holy. How do we know what holy looks like? The same way we know what love looks like. God is holy. Uh, God is separate from all, and we should be separate from all things that are not godly. So terms like godly and holy and love all come from the same source, uh, he is the creator, the designer, the definer, as I mentioned. And the Bible tells us that he did this because of love, right? He created man in his own image in the Garden of Eden. He provided man with everything that he needed. And the reason he did that was because he loved. God so loved the world. Uh, it's also a great love because of who he loves, right? Right? It's easy to love your friends and those who like you and love you back. Jesus died for the, sin, for the sins of the world, the people who hated him. He died for the ungodly. He died for the sins of the people who cursed at him, pierced him, put the crown of thorns on his head. He died for the sins of all, of all, the world. And, of course, the world here isn't talking about the dirt, the terra firma. It's talking about humans, people who live on earth. For God so loved the world, he loved everybody. Uh, this shows the greatness of God in that even people, well, none of us were worthy of God's love. Right? That, that, he extended his love to people who didn't show reason to be loved. <laughs> and so that's the greatness of God's love. Uh, those he loves do not have to earn his love. He loves. Uh, God loves all men. He wants them to come to a knowledge of truth. Why? Because he wants them to be saved. Why? Because he loves them. Now, does that mean that God's going to save all men? No. God doesn't save all people because people don't love God. The reciprocation comes later in this verse. Uh, as I mentioned in 1 John chapter 2, uh, Jesus becoming the propitiation for the sins of the world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And obviously that, that doesn't mean that you're sinlessly perfect. It just means once you know you're, you've sinned, quit doing it. Don't continue to sin. So the sin not means quit sinning. Don't continue to sin. And if any man sin, that's if we mess up. We have an advocate with, Father, with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So God the Father obviously is the source of love, and Jesus Christ, the one who fulfilled the law perfectly, sinlessly, he is our advocate. And then verse 2, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now this is important, especially with regard to John 3.16, because a lot of people, uh, even in the denominational world, memorize this world and uh, teach or memorize this verse and teach this verse. But then they go and teach a doctrine that God didn't shed his blood for those who are in sin, those who are lost. They say that God only, or Jesus only shed his blood for those who are predestined or preordained to salvation. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God loved the whole world, that he gave his only begotten son for the whole world, that Jesus was the propitiation for the whole world. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, Second Corinthians 5, verse 17, 
Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto to them, uh, and hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then we, and that's the, the apostles here, are ambassadors of Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. That's the payment price for sin. He died on the cross. The wages of sin is death. Jesus took that uh, role upon himself to die for the sins of the whole world. Not just people who, uh, not just anyone, but everybody. Nobody was saved without the blood of Christ. So without this sacrifice, there was no salvation for anybody. Uh, for he hath made him to be sin for us, the payment price for sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So to say that God saved a few people and then made his son die for those people, even though they were already saved, is a waste of Jesus' blood. Which is contrary to their doctrine, which says if Jesus died for those who were ungodly, which the Bible says he did, then they say that's a waste of blood. Jesus didn't waste any blood. He shed the blood that was necessary to save the world. And everybody that will believe on him can have that hope of eternal life. God so loved the world. Uh, in Romans 5, verse, uh, Romans chapter 5, we'll start in verse 6. This, this connects John 15 to John 3, 1 John 2. Romans chapter 5, verse 6, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus didn't die for people that were saved because they weren't saved. They needed his blood to be saved. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, the ungodly, the people who needed his blood. It's, it's sad to look at John 3.16 and think, well, Jesus didn't die for people who needed his blood. <laughs> of course he did. And who needed the blood? Everybody. So he died for the ungodly. Uh, verse 7, if I can turn my page. Now notice this. This goes back to John 15, verse 13. No greater love hath man than to die for his friend. Notice verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But notice verse 8 and 9. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Did Jesus die for sinners? Yes. Why? They needed salvation. That's why Jesus died. When we look at John 3, verse 16, it, it destroys that denominational doctrine that God didn't, uh, Jesus didn't shed his blood for a certain group of people, only for a predestinated group of people. The Bible says Jesus died for the ungodly. He died for us while we were yet sinners. If we were not in sin, if we didn't need the blood of Christ, then why would Jesus die for the sins of the world if they didn't need it? The greatness of God's love is seen in that he offered it to all people, right? The whole world. He loved everybody. Another aspect of uh, the greatness of God's love in John 3.16 is seen in how much he loved the extent to which God went to show his love. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Mm -hmm. There's different uh, thinking on this word so loved, the word so there as it applies in this verse. Uh, some think it's a word that extenuates the how much God loved. He so loved. Some believe it's the manner in which he loved. Really, it doesn't matter because this verse has both the manner and the how much. How much did he love the world? He gave his only begotten son. To what extent did he love the world? He gave his only begotten son. <laughs> he showed a lot of love, and he showed us the manner in which he gave that love through giving his only begotten son. And 
the, the idea of only begotten here is extremely important. Uh, there are a lot of people in the world since the history of time who have had only one son, right? There's a lot of people in the world who've had one son. Jesus isn't just a one son, right, or an only son. Jesus is the only begotten son of God, the only begotten, which means uh, only begotten doesn't just mean only son. It means he's unique. And the uniqueness here is uh, in the fact that he's the only one like him. Now, we could go, that's another sermon, right? Jesus is the only one like him. He's the only God born into the flesh, right? John chapter 1 tells us about that. For the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Nothing ever like that's ever done before. He left his heavenly home and was born into the flesh and lived as a man, was tempted like as we are yet without sin, only happened once. So the only begotten here emphasizes this isn't just your normal everyday average only child, only son. This is the only begotten. That's the extent to which God loved, how much God loved, that he gave his only begotten son And, of course, uh, the love here that we're talking about, we don't even have to know the Greek word to know what the love is when you give your only begotten son, the one of a kind, the God in the flesh. It's agape, right? The, the, the strongest of all love, the sacrificial love. This was a sacrifice. God made sacrifice, and then Jesus himself made sacrifice. He gave himself, Acts 20, verse 28, right? He gave himself. It's an unselfish love. It was a love that he what uh, Jesus didn't do this for himself. He didn't die on the cross for himself. God didn't send his son to die on the cross for because of it, what he wanted. He did it because he loved the world. And so when we think of what God gave, there's nothing we could give God that would ever come close, is there? We could never repay that gift. Nor should we want to. That's not what God wanted. But we can give our thanks, thankfulness, and God does want that. He wants our thankfulness, appreciation for what he did for us. Jesus was unique. He was a one of a kind. Uh, he was the only one who could perform this duty. And he had to do it voluntarily, and he did. That's because he loved us. And so we see how much God loved, and we see to the extent that, to which God loved, uh, and I mentioned God loved the whole world, and that shows who God loved, but we can, the emphasis is reiterated again in John 3.16. For God so loved the world, not just some people in the world, he sent his son to die for the sins of the whole world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. To whom did he offer this love? To whomsoever. Right? So that goes back to that sins of the whole world. Those who say, well, some people are predetermined to salvation and some are predestined to damnation and there's nothing you can do to switch. And the John 3.16, one of the most popular, well-known Bob, uh, Bible verses in the, in, in the religious world, says just the opposite of what denominations teach. So if they just look at John 3.16, one of the most popular verses in the Bible, as, as far as knowing, they're all equal. They're all equal, word of God. It says, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, which means that there's not a separation before individuals make a choice. That whosoever, this means that God's love is universal. It doesn't matter about where you're born how much money you make, your skin color, uh, what language you speak, whosoever. When Jesus uh, came on the scene, uh, obviously there, one of the big problems that Jesus and the apostles, uh, and we're reading through the book of Hebrews on Wednesday night, so even the individuals who were living after Jesus had died, one of the things they had to deal with was this uh, 
prejudiced idea that the Jews were, were God's only people, that God was only going to save those people. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees all kind of promoted that doctrine and, and preaching. Uh, but the Bible says whosoever. It wasn't just one group of people. Now, God did use the Jews. They were a special people for a purpose. And, of course, Galatians chapter 3, verse 15 and through verse 29 tells us what that purpose was, to bring about the blood of Christ. So we're thankful for the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. That nation doesn't exist anymore spiritually. The state does, and the state, the political state of Israel, is an ally and a friend. But the nation of Israel as a spiritual people doesn't exist. It was, that law was nailed to the cross, uh, Colossians 2, verse 14. But God loved everybody, and he, died. he sent his son to die for whosoever. Uh, and so when you talk with individuals who might say that there are some who are elect and some who are not elect, some are predestined and some are not predestined, uh, Calvinism, uh, remind them of John 3.16 that says God loved the whole world, not just some people, and left some people to die in sin, and he offered his love to whosoever, whosoever will. Uh, that's what the Bible teaches. Uh, in Revelation 3, uh, when Jesus is giving that revelation to John, uh, verse 20, he says, If any man hear my voice, how many men? Any man. And what does he have to do? Hear my voice. And open the door. So there's more than just hear. There's more than just believe. You have to open the door. Jesus says, I will come to him. Any man, he said. So whosoever believeth in him uh, shall not perish. And, of course, perish is the consequence of not believing in God. John 3, 16, whosoever believeth in him should not perish. If you don't believe in God, you will perish, right? You'll die in your sins because you don't believe in the only way to being saved. Uh, perish here is the antonym, the opposite of eternal life, right? So we have everlasting life, which is mentioned here in John three sixteen. And perish. So you either have everlasting life, which is a life in heaven with God, or perish, which we know from the scripture is a life in eternity in hell with the devil and those who loved him. God didn't want people to perish. And so he sent his only begotten son. It was out of God's love because, that he didn't want people to perish. Now, just because God doesn't want people to perish doesn't mean that they won't perish. Man has an obligation to not perish. We have to believe. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish. So there's something we must do in order to not perish. God doesn't want us to perish. So God has made a way for us to not perish. And then the next part of John 3.16 is the positive. So here we have the negative. God does not want us to perish or be lost. And then the positive, God's love is he wants us to have everlasting life. So this is the opposite of perish, right? Being lost. These are the only two classes of people we see in the New Testament, right? The lost and the saved. There's not predestined and prede not predestined. It's lost and saved. So the importance of John 3.16 is to find out how do we get into the class of saved. God has made a way by which we can be saved and not perish. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, when he talks about that parting uh, between the sheep and the goats, he says, uh, These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Matthew 25 verse 46 so everlasting life is a picture of how great God's love is, right? And we've talked about no tears in heaven, no pain in heaven. Uh, it's just glorious, right? It's worshiping God. It's all the good things that we can possibly think of, but then it's greater than that. It's the grandeur of heaven uh, which awaits. It's the inheritance for those who obey God.
The importance uh, of John 3.16 here is that the love of God requires a response. It's God sent his son because he loved the whole world. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. He died that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What must whosoever do? They must believe. Now this uh, is an important concept of John 3.16. There are individuals who say you can believe and believe only and therefore have everlasting life. How much did God love the world, the whole world, that he sent his only begotten son, that they might not perish but have everlasting life? How much did God love the world? Right? We see that in John 3.16. Now, how much do we need to believe to have everlasting life? How much do we need to believe? Do we just believe what we want, pick and choose? I like this verse. It says, believe, I'll do that. This verse says, repent, and that means I have to quit doing things I don't like. I'm going to leave that one out. Is that believing in Jesus? Is that whosoever believeth? I don't want to repent of that because I like it. No, if you believe in Jesus and if you believe that Jesus died for the ungodly and that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, if you don't want to perish, you have to believe. You have to believe that he said believe and you have to believe that he said repent. You also have to believe John 14 verse 6 which said, I am the way, the truth, and life and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way. There's only one way. And so when Jesus says... In Matthew 10, 32 and 33, if you don't confess me before men, I won't confess you before my Father. Do you have to believe that? Whosoever believeth, do you have to believe that? That you must confess that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God? Every person that was saved in the New Testament believed that you had to believe. They believed that you had to repent. And they believed you had to confess. We have many examples through the book of Acts of individuals who did just that. Philip, when he, uh, before he baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch said, here is water, what must I do to be saved? And Peter, uh, uh, Philip said, if you believe, you can be baptized. Belief is a prerequisite to baptism. But before he was baptized, he confessed his faith that he believed. He said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then he was baptized. Why? Because Jesus teach, taught that you have to believe, you have to repent, you have to confess, and you have to be baptized. If you believe one or two of those and not the other, you, you're not whosoever believeth. Whosoever believeth will hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And you won't leave parts of it out. You'll believe it all. So when God says faith comes by hearing, you say faith comes by hearing. When you read, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2 verse 38, you repent and you're baptized. That's for believers. Those people will not perish. They'll have everlasting life. If you hear the word of God and don't do it, the Bible says you're like a man who builds your house on the sand. You just believe a little bit. You build a little bit, but you're on the wrong foundation. You don't believe to the point of salvation. So belief means that we hear the word of God, we believe the word of God, we repent of our sins, we confess that Jesus is the Christ, and we don't stop believing. Whosoever believeth, that means you're always a believer. You don't point action, become a believer, and then stop believing. Once you're a believer, you continue to believe. You believe to the point of death, Revelation 2 verse 10, and then you'll receive a crown of life. John 3.16 is a very powerful verse if it's uh, understood as God wants us to understand it and appreciate it as God wants us to appreciate it. Uh, it's a verse that it's good for us to memorize and know, but we need to know the detail. It's also important for us not just to memorize and not know what it means. How many people quote John 3.16 and don't do it? And, of course, that goes with any verse. This is just a good example. Uh, if we can be of any service to anybody today, come now as we stand and sing.